Okay, good morning, good morning. Uh, so, uh, it's good to see everybody's faces here. Uh, welcome to uh, insight practice that we're doing today. Um, over the past few weeks, we've been working with various expressions of, um, well, some of the, the um, uh, some of the columns on the uh, Universal Library for Training of Attention, the um, Unified Mindfulness um, Practices of Shenzhen Yang. So I figured that we could maybe go back to the basics a little bit. Um, so uh, really looking at this thing of insight and maybe how the see, hear, feel practice itself works uh, into it and how, how it's relevant. Um, so let's, let's go to the Blackboard. Here we go. Let's see if I can move some things around here. Okay, very good. So um, let's look at this. So foundations, um, insight practice, working with the see, hear, feel. Um, okay, so as I can see, I didn't complete this. I kind of just like throw this together right before I, I jump on here. So vipassana, uh, insight practice. Uh, I didn't finish writing this, so vipassana. Um, so pasana meaning to see, the V meaning with clarity. You know? So there's the sense of how is it that we can um, see our experience more clearly and also the other connotation of clarity or clear in terms of seeing through. How is it that we can see through our experience? Uh, so um, it's often um, uh, regarded in the uh, early Buddhist suttas uh, that it's one of two qualities of mind uh, that are developed on the way towards awakening or that support the awakening process. So the vipassana, how is it that we can clearly see and see through our experience? And the shamatha, how is it that we can kind of cool down that experience? Um, both relate to um, different flavors of, of liberation. The, the insight practice gives us that discernment release um, by having such a, a high sensory clarity um, and uh, uh, seeing our experience without falling asleep to it. Um, there's a way in which we can kind of let go of habitual grasping. And as well, the shamatha, how is it that we can bear witness to our experience while kind of cooling any want to grasp? Um, you know, it helps to allow this bringing up the, the experience and then letting go of the experience in a way. Uh, so we can kind of unearth a lot of our deeper um, habit patterns, drivenness, what have you, um, things that really are some of the, the deeper seated um, aspects or habits of, um, uh, of grasping and creating some discontent. So uh, within the Pali Canon, so that's early uh, Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, all the affiliated and associated um, uh, early schools of Buddhism, um, we have uh, you know, one of the goals per se in inside a Vipassana practice is to see the three marks, Dukkha, Anicca, Anatta. Can we see the discontent um, clearly, uh, the discontent that you're experiencing this moment? Um, how is it arising? Uh, on what sense gate? Uh, what sense gates, plural, uh, are they occurring in? Uh, where is this resistance showing up? Can we have some increased sensory clarity so we can discern where that is taking place? Can we have sufficient um, uh, 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 concentration to be able to hold that in our attention, sufficient equanimity in order to really kind of process, let go, allow that activity to happen? And in so doing, we can gain uh, some insight into the anicca or the impermanence quality, kind of allowing letting go. And as we are kind of letting go from a, a lot of what we might have been previously gripping or grasping, be that um, some drivenness, compulsion, an emotional state, what have you, some belief that underlies our, our, our suffering. Um, you know, as we're allowing that to kind of go back or express itself in impermanence, we can see the relinquishing of the grasp of our identification with it, you know, the identification with whatever stance we're having. Again, be it a, a drivenness, a compulsivity, obsessive mental state, or just the general eh, kind of feeling of meh. It's pervasive. Um, so, Pali Canon, seeing the three marks of dukkha, nicca, natta within the Mahayana traditions, it's more so seeing of uh, sunyata or emptiness. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of the different schools like to 
form walls and barriers, I don't see necessarily the difference between the two. I think that they're, these two schools are having a similar conversation. They're just looking at it from different banks of the river. The emptiness has within it the suggestion of the not self. You know, it's just, can we see the emptying out of stress? Can we see the emptying out of the identification uh, of self with whatever um, sensory activity is arising? You know, and can we appreciate the absence of that? So in a way, it's like the, the early Buddhist Theravadan is more like the, the paint by numbers or the how-to manual of this is the suffering, this is the step-by-step -step of relinquishing. And then the Mahayana is more like the, hey, it's, relinqu it's relinquished, can we appreciate it? Yeah. So I think, I've, to me, um, they're just uh, different facets of the same jewel, so to speak. So either way, uh, inside practice, Seeing through the delusion, the false uh, perceptions, false beliefs, associations, uh, becoming unhooked from our habit patterns, compulsions, drivenness, that all have a self-identification at its core. Yeah. So anytime that we're caught in something, um, anytime that we are having a, um, a, a state of discontent uh, or a disappointment or all the way to abject suffering, we're usually very strongly identified with a belief, a perception, a stance. So, you know, how is it that we can break that core identity of I am from that, that um, state that is occurring? And in no way is this suggesting a dissociation or repression or something. More so, how is it that we can clearly see in a way that we're awake? You know? So ultimately, we're looking at this idea of the self. And so, of course, many philosophers and schools of thought and psychology all posit their own uh, theories about what a self is. But within Buddha Dharma, um, roughly, uh, we could say that the self is a phenomena uh, that tends to arise by its subcomponents of self kind of congealing together when we're not looking at it. But when we look clearly at the self and, and how is it that this phenomena arises, it tends to disentangle. So there's no clear, uh, indivisible, you know, solid, permanent thing of a self. You know, it's a phenomena that arises. We all have a sense of self here, but if we try to keep a, a contact with that sense of self, it tends to fluctuate during the day. If we get into an argument, we get into a disagreement, somebody calls you out in public, boom, that sense of self may get really, really big and solid. Um, if we might be in states of being alone and there's less uh, things in our environment to call a personality into view and we might become quiet and just engaged in an activity, um, especially if it's something that we enjoy, the sense of self begins to thin out and diminish and we're just kind of uh, merging with uh, uh, appreciation of activity. So the sense of self kind of rises and falls throughout the day. Um, so a lot of the Vipassana practice is about, well, let's look, let's become curious about this uh, thing of the self. Um, so it tends to disentangle when looked at directly. Um, so looking at the subcomponents of self. So this is where we're getting into the Shenzhen speak here. Um, so there's a particular way of working. It's not the only way of working, um, but it's a way that I like to work because I find it to be, how shall we say, um, clear, well-defined, and some uh, tangible um, things to look at. You know, if we can really have contact with something and maintain contact with something, we can really see what's going on in that relationship. So we're looking at uh, the mind-body experience. Uh, within the mind, we have the expression of seeing or any thinking that occurs in images, the mind's eye creating images of fantasy, planning, daydream. So that subtle or not so subtle, subtle image-based activity. That happens. Most people report, you know, when they're lost in fantasy, daydream, planning, you know, it's kind of around the eyes, the forehead. Um, a, a little side note, it doesn't have to be that way, though. There are many people that are not particularly wired for image-based thought. Um, they're more verbally oriented. So some people might report, I'm not seeing any images. What am I doing wrong? Well, you're not doing anything wrong. This is just an interesting thing to, to see how we're all kind of wired a little differently. So the other side of the coin, mental activity, is the hearing activity. Or any thinking that occurs in words, the mind's inner talk, the commentaries, conversations, words that you hear. Yeah, so 
Most people report that activity somewhere around in between the ears. So this is just taking the world of uh, 10,000 things that occur in, in concepts and ideas, just reducing it down to those two activities, that which we see, that which we hear. Um, we do not have to have activity in one or the other. Uh, everybody is wired a little bit differently. So if you're dominant in one, that's great. It just means you're dominant in one. And of course, coming into the body, uh, feel. Any sensation that's detected in the bodily form could have the pressure on pressure sensations of, of your posture, of breath itself, uh, 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 of um, just the aches and pains, tensions and relaxations within the body. Uh, those pressure on pressure sensations. And then there becomes, uh, there can be sensations that are a little bit more personal or the emotions, the anger, fear, sadness, uh, uh, hopelessness, disgust, joy, love, humor, compassion, any of these sensations that uh, arise and express themselves throughout the body. That's more the feel in experience. So um, we're looking with this see here feel practice. Yeah. So um, that's a lot of the basis of a lot of the insight work that I do, but I figure we can kind of go back to the basics. You know, um, we can kind of get into it, but we'll kind of explore just kind of the in, the out, and the rest states that can occur within see, hear, feel. Uh, but I just thought I'd just do a little reminder refresher um, and maybe kind of also a, a reintroduction for some of the people that might be newer. Uh, before we go into the set, does that, anybody have any questions, comments about anything? Of course, this will all be guided. All right, sounds good. So allow yourself to come to a comfortable upright position. Allow yourself to straighten up and settle in. We're going to be working with some inside practice today, but we can start off with cultivating some shamatha. A little calming, cooling of the mind, allowing the mind to recollect and settle into the body. So we find our way towards the breath. I invite you to anchor your attention to a part of the body actively engaged in breathing. that the nose, throat, lungs, or belly.
I'm merely paying attention to the mechanical entering and exiting of air, but what are some of the pleasant qualities that can be appreciated and are available on the in-breath? That are uniquely available at the top of the in-breath and that pause before we exhale again. available on the out breath. And are available at the base of the out breath. I pause before we breathe in again. Okay, good. So just a reminder that breath is always there. Breath is always available. Now to bring the breath with you as we transition to insight or at any time you can go back to simple contact with breath. And we can slowly transition to the insight practice by expanding the scope of focus to being aware of this full feeling form of the body. Allowing your awareness to just free float within the body. And noticing the rise and fall of various sensations in the feel space. You can just kind of lightly notice, observe what's arising and passing and feel space, or you can hang out a little bit longer, zoom into your experience, really get into the details of the sensation. And just be aware of any degree of craving or aversion that can arise. And how is it that whatever arises, you're meeting with a sense of openness, acceptance, equanimity?
And of course, as we're hanging out in the body, the mind has its own plans. So that's fine. Let's roll that into the experience. Allow yourself to contact seeing space, general mind's eye. It projects images of fantasy, planning, daydream, somewhere around the eyes, the forehead, wherever it is for you that mental imaging takes place. Just allow yourself to be aware of contact this general sea space. And of course, we can also contact ear space as well. General region between the ears that are internal commentaries, conversations, any verbal or auditory component of thought, usually between the ears, so be aware of in contact with hearing space. And allow yourself to allow awareness to free float between seeing, hearing, and feeling. And moment by moment, wherever your attention is primarily drawn, just contact. Label it. So as I'm labeling, might sound something like this. Feel. Hear. Feel. See. See and feel. And so on like that. So by acknowledging the seeing and hearing experience, it is not an invitation to fall down the rabbit hole of every thought that arises. Can we be awake? Stepping back a bit, just acknowledge an arising and passing of seeing, an arising and passing of hearing, an arising and passing of feeling. This is increasing our discernment knowing of what is taking place, the quality of sampajana, the full complete knowing of the impermanence, the activity of our subjective experience.
So we contact the sensory event. We label it, see, hear, or feel. We really explore. Explore what is that particular activity at that sense gate. What is that like? How do you experience it? What's the sensory clarity potential there? And all the while, can you accept? Meet it with that sense of equanimity, openness, a willingness to experience, but in a way that you're not gripping or grasping. So what we're doing is we're just looking at this activity. This activity of this flow of sensory events. So part of the present time awareness is contacting, labeling, exploring and accepting. But also a significant part of the experience is relinquishing, releasing, letting go. So we can open up into the next moment. You don't have to be aware of everything. It's okay to miss some things, allow some things to go by. Just at least have some part of your awareness tethered back, acknowledging, seeing, hearing, feeling. Just a facet of your experience at a time.
So part of this is the sensory clarity. How clearly are you awake and aware of your experience? Moment by moment, can you discern what aspect of your experience is seeing, hearing, or feeling? And how high def is that experience? Or high resolution? Part of this is the concentration. How long can you hold your awareness on a given sensory activity? Part of this is about the equanimity. To what degree can you just allow whatever wants to occur to occur? A sense of openness, a willingness to experience without resisting. Having qualities of kindness, curiosity, and a deep acceptance. Just what are the subcomponents of this moment. And of this moment. And of this moment. Okay, good. So we've been doing a lot of efforting and parsing out our experience. You can just let go of all of that. Just allow yourself to just rest in an open awareness, a do nothing strategy. Just appreciate whatever quality of awareness is feeling rather awake in this moment.
everybody. Post bell practice allowing yourself to still be open to the merits of your efforts. But what did you notice? What did you observe? What was um, relevant for you this morning? And of course, any questions you might have had on the practice in general, feel free to unmute yourself and manifest. Mike, if I may. I, um, you know, I noticed um, it was a very good sit for me today, which is nice. Um, how little we, I, rest in awareness. And awareness doesn't bring, to me anyway, um, stress. I'm either aware or, or I'm not or... You know, my awareness goes to my body, it goes to a sound, it goes to roomy barking. But I'm, I'm not in the doing in life that I've been accustomed to for all the years that I've been on this earth. You know, we have to do, you have to do this, I have to go to school, now I've got to pay my bills, now I've got to go online, I've got to go to B of A, blah, blah. And how much stress is related to that. And I think this COVID thing, because... Um, it's taken away a lot of the doing aspect of it. Um, people have been more aware. You're more aware of your surroundings. I'm more aware of my, the home I live in. I've seen corners of this house that during my regular life, it's just, you know, go to work, quick, quick breakfast, off I go, I come back. And it's just interesting because when I sit, and awareness has a, a quality of just being that the anatta aspect of my life, I can see that. Like when I, when I have these moments where I just like, it's just sounds, it's oxygen coming in, it's, it's noise, it's, it's a visual, it's a smell, but it's just, it just comes and goes. And, and I'm like, Every now and then I go, oh, oh yeah, that hurts. Oh yeah, that's me. Oh, that's Jonathan. Mm -hmm. But then I just go back to awareness. But when I'm doing, it's real hard to be in awareness because there's a doing aspect. There's a Jonathan doing. I do, I, the, the self then becomes, um, overrides whatever awareness. And even if I get glimpses of, I know it's me doing it. There's a self because the self does and then I see an accomplishment. So Jonathan accomplished this task. Mm -hmm. And it's just very interesting just to, just to sit and not have to do anything except be aware. And then the logical side of me that goes, yeah, yeah, but you, you got to do things. There's stuff to do. Mm -hmm. But when I can just rest, the heart attacks come from the doing and not doing. Mm -hmm what I did or didn't do or the stress around that. It's the stress around the doing. Yeah. Being yeah. aware is just, I'm not going to get a heart attack being aware and not aware of something, just resting in awareness. I can tell you that right now. So there's something I think, I thank you for that reflection. I appreciate that. Um, going back to what I was saying earlier about kind of the, the, the Theravada and the Mahayana uh, views of the, three characteristics, dukkha, nicca, natta, and then the Mahayana sunyata, the stress, the uh, uh, impermanence, and the not-self versus the emptiness and how they kind of kind of coexist in this way. Um, you know, when we rest in awareness, that's kind of the resting in the emptiness, the emptiness of the doing, the emptiness of the selfing, the emptiness of the congealing. Um, but then eventually the self arises and, you know, to, to your point, it engages in the doing. And it's identified as the solid thing that has to, there's that urgency that comes up. So how is it then that we can kind of detangle or disentangle that experience into, oh, this is the stressful part. 
oh, now that I'm clearly seeing it, it's relinquishing back into impermanence and breaking my identification. And then boom, just kind of the resting and awareness, the emptiness can arise again. So we just kind of go through this parastalsis through the day of just kind of opening and non-selfing, just being, and then congealing into selfing and doing. So how so that we can just kind of go with kind of this back and forth between the two. Yeah, Kim. So I love this practice. I love the Wednesday. And so to go back to what Jonathan's saying, what you just said, I think where I struggle is I'm aware of the need to do, right? Like, like I have to work, I have to pay the bills, I have to take care of my dog, all, all these have tos. Mm -hmm. And I can sit in awareness, but I kind of struggle with, I still have to do these things, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, we all do to live our life. And then, I, and so that's kind of where I'm like, because there's a huge part of me that just wants to literally not get out of bed in the morning and just see what will happen. <laughs> but you just the, totally go on protest and just don't yeah. get out of bed. But like Jonathan said, the logical piece is, well, then you'll lose your job, you'll lose <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's when the stress arises. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. what do you do? Well, you know, part of the reason that, um, uh, you know, at the end of each of these, I kind of give the, the life practice homework because ultimately it's about, well, at what point does that just abiding and awareness shut off and is traded in for, I have to become stressed in my doing. And, you know, versus at what point can we still have this resting and awareness while we engage in activities? You know, so there's the difference between the, all right, I got to go pay the bills. I got to go to P of A. And then we're just filled with rumination and just kind of just all these, conf you know, feelings of conflict and, and um, opposition and pressure and stress versus okay, now this is just awareness engaging in this activity. You know, awareness is now sitting and breathing. Awareness is now moving towards the desk and opening up the day planner and just looking, all right, what shows up at this time? Okay, awareness can make this phone call and I can be aware of the person I'm talking to, you know, how what they're saying hits the emotional part of me, what's arising and spreading and feel space, you know, what is arising and seeing here space as I'm formulating my words, can I be awareness, just be with the activity of speaking. So, you know, so within the, the Shin speak, the Shinzen speak, that would be the, you know, all of the auto, you know, auto move, auto speak, all of that. Can we just manifest from emptiness in a way? Um, so, you know, part of the practice is how do we go from this from nomadic self to just kind of reducing down to a simplicity of awareness. And then how can we go from awareness to boom, manifesting a personality, but just manifesting the doing that needs to be done, but leaving behind, not necessarily having to bring along with it all of the rumination and stress, the feelings of conflict and aversion, uh, adversity, craving and, and such. Um, you know, it, it's like um, uh, uh, the other day I got, you know, probably three significant projects that have to do with work, well-being, finances, all kind of, I just got assailed with just kind of bad news, barriers, no, before you go into the next step, here's 32 steps you have to do. And I, I was just kind of like, oh, took the wind out of my sails. And I had this sense of kind of throwing my hands up, like, oh man, this is terrible. And I was really identified with the frustration because I felt like I was moving along and I hit this wall. And that feeling of aversion and like, ugh. And then um, after a while, it's like, oh, okay, well, that's just what needs to be done. And it's just picking up of like, all right, now I have to do this and this. And I was just talking about it with my wife yesterday. And she's like, well, there's a big difference. What happened in the last 24 hours? <laughs> you know, yesterday you were ready to crawl in a hole. Today you're just like, it's, it's Tuesday. Um, and there is something about that. I mean, it's just like looking at like, oh, uh, I'm accepting that this is what needs to be done right now. And can I take out the rumination and the feeling of conflict within that and just allow awareness to engage in that activity. It uh -huh. sounds like, are you saying to be aware of how are we relating to these things and then shifting from that? Is, is that right? Along those lines. Yeah. It's definitely the, the relationship, isn't it? 
Yeah, you know, okay. it's like the more that I'm aware that there's this relation, that there's this thing, I'm aware of my relationship and what's in that. Is there aversion and dislike towards it? Is there preference for some other experience and just the struggling within that? So it's the relationship of whatever the activity is. Um, and I, I'm, I'm subject to it myself. I mean, I'm, I'm naturally averse to paperwork. I'm naturally averse to all of these things that are less uh, within my realm of personal interests. But it's just when I really examine it and I sit down to do the paperwork or the notes or whatever, it's like, it's really just my relationship. You know, am I permitting, allowing the, all of the hypertrophy of rumination and the internal expression of resistance to arise? Or can I just, you know, have some equanimity with the doing? And then it can become a very pleasurable experience. You know, the, the Dharma doors are numberless. I vow to enter all of them. <laughs> the Dharma door can be going to the bank, you know, making that phone call, doing that particular note that you have to, to put in. Um, yeah. Does that sound relevant? Does that sound? It does, but the, when you just said that, what I, what I, what my mind went to is, well, then that's just like resigning to, I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of that, when I hear the word acceptance, oftentimes I equate that with resigning. Like, oh, I, this is here. I have to accept it. Why resist it? Yeah. So in a way, there's like this connotation of failure. I'm it's like I have no choice. No choice. Yeah. Well, I guess there is. I mean. But you do have choices to how you do it. Yeah. Designing has such a negative, do you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I have to, there's certain things I have to do. I don't like doing them, but how I do them, I can go, well, you know, um, I can put on some James Taylor and do it. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Okay, so it's my wife, my wife plays Von G You know what I mean? It's like... There's a shifting of perspective, and there's also... You know, recognizing that, yeah, by because we're hanging out in this world of forms and relativity. Um, I mean, the relative versus the absolute in, in Buddhist terms. The absolute being just the abiding and kind of awakened uh, 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 dharmakaya versus, all right, I'm hanging out in this world where I have to do the laundry and, and do my chores. There is a little bit of a resigning of, yeah, we have to. You know, I, I have to feed myself. May, I can choose not to, but there's definitely a consequence. Um, so there is something a, a, about looking at the resigning, but also just looking at the, the cause and effect. You know, um, I, I, I show up, I do my job and everything. And the effect is, you know, money shows up in the bank account and I can feed my family. And sometimes that feels oppressive and I can say, all right, I'm not going to show up, but the consequence is I lose my job and can't feed my family and, and just that existential awareness is is a lot there's definitely a burden to it so sometimes you know having to just kind of accept that these are responsibilities there can be a resigning part and and i think that's part of the um kind of the heaviness of this human experience but to like you know i guess what jonathan was saying well there's one way we can do it where we can struggle all along or just put on some music and how can this also be a pleasurable experience too Okay, it goes back to how are we relating to mm -hmm. yeah. whatever is, is in front of us. Yeah, how we're relating. Th thank you for reducing it and simplifying it. And, and That's how work. my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, uh, we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you, everybody, for your you. general amazingness. Uh, so homework as you go through the day, and you're doing all these horrible things <laughs> that we have to resign ourselves to do. Can we look at just the feeling of dukkha within that, you know, is there some like, Ugh, I don't want to do this. You know? Okay. Can we have some increased sensory clarity? How's that showing up and see, hear, or feel? And can we just kind of meet that with equanimity and then just see how that can return to some impermanence go away. And then we can, we see the disidentification with uh, the stress or whatever, and just allow that just awareness to then engage in the activity. No simple homework, but um, worthwhile to just kind of allow awareness to engage in the activity. Mm. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Me too. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye.